Welcome to Flipped Classroom. Today's topic is the critical thinking process. Critical comes from the Greek word, which means one who can judge and discern. The three major components are analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. Analysis is breaking down information into its parts. For example, looking at the specific personality traits in a character from literature, or looking at the specific setting in a scene from a story. Also, if you're looking at a report, you'd be looking at the facts or in a chart looking at statistics. The next step is synthesis. That is putting together elements and parts to form a new whole. For example, taking information from various books to examine the implications, or looking at various images in a photo to draw a conclusion about moods of the people. Personal background can be an influence on the outcome. That's why often there are multiple answers. Some answers are better than others. The next step is evaluation. This is where you judge according to standards and criteria. The challenge becomes when you ask the question, whose standards? To determine this, you look at credibility, significance, and bias. For example, was President Truman a hero or a villain for authorizing the dropping of the atomic bomb? For the Americans, they may consider Truman a hero for bringing World War II to a close. If you lived in Hiroshima or Nagasaki, you may have a different opinion. So the steps to the critical thinking process are cyclical. You think by considering the topic or problem. Then you read critically relevant sources of information and then through writing present your arguments that pass the critical scrutiny of readers. This is what you're doing in your research paper. You must make sure that you support critical thinking with evidence. Evidence can come in the form of facts, which are verifiable information, statistics, which are facts expressed in numbers, expert testimony, those with knowledge gained in a specialized field, or first-hand observations. This will add concrete evidence to explain abstract concepts. When using resources, you have a choice between paraphrasing, summarizing, and quoting. You will frequently use paraphrasing and summarizing. To paraphrase, you put the main ideas in your own words. These can be medium to long in length. When you summarize, you're making a general restatement of the main idea found in the source, and these tend to be much shorter. Be careful about quoting. It should be used rarely. You should only quote when you're using exact words from a source that are so memorable that paraphrasing wouldn't do it justice. For example, if you're taking President Kennedy's inauguration speech, he says, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. To paraphrase that, you would lose the main emphasis. The same is true with Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. To paraphrase Martin Luther King, you would lose the emphasis. What's wrong with using too many quotes? When you do that, you're creating a data dump. You are missing analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. Long quotes can be long and confusing, and it is more accessible for an audience when information is brief and in your own words. When you do use resources to support your ideas, make sure it is in MLA format and you have a Works Cited page as well as a parenthetical citation or an embedded lead-in. Be very precise with your Works Cited page. In addition, make sure you avoid plagiarizing. Even when you are merely summarizing or paraphrasing, you must use parenthetical citations. Keep in mind that English 300, English 1A, is not only a composition class, but a critical thinking class. What makes it different from a high school English class is your ability to analyze, synthesize, and evaluate information.